Welcome back to another episode of the Overcoming Odds Podcast, where you get a glimpse into the stories of individuals who have overcome adversity, suffering, and struggle in achieving their personal success. I'm your host, Oleg Lohid, and today's guest is someone that I highly recommend for anyone who is just starting off in the music industry. She has been involved with numerous bands and individual performers. In addition, she's also a survivor of the Operation Baby Lift, which was formed to evacuate orphans from South Vietnam to the United States. So without further ado, please welcome Laura Price. Thank you. Laura, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So I got a chance to briefly meet you, and if I remember correctly, we actually left off talking about Operation Baby Lift. Yes, you're right. Good memory. So I figured, <laughs> why not just start off with that? And sure. If you can give us some you know, details about how that all started and where you were in the process of it. Well, Operation Baby Lift was an effort to um, evacuate adoptees from Vietnam. And the fear was is that these adoptees, orphans, were um, abandoned because they were half American. And the fear was that they were all going to be burned. And so the Yukon was going to come and, you know, massacre all these children. So the United States government put in place, and I think there was obviously political and humanitarian. As always. Yeah. So 3,000 babies actually went under Operation Baby Lift. I think it was a little more than that, unofficially. But 3,000 officially left, you know, April 75. Um, and they got dispersed actually throughout the world, like France, Australia, Sweden, um, America, obviously. Um, and I think there's maybe Canada. I don't know exactly all the different countries, but... I, I, don't, I know I have some adoptee friends that have been adopted wow. in those countries. Who, yeah. who got to decide the adoptions? Was so it the I, government that who got to decide split, where you went? Yeah, that split the kids amongst different countries? or? Uh, I don't actually know how that went. There were different agencies. Mine was um, Friends for All Children of Vietnam. And somehow, depending on what orphanage you are in, so I went. I was in two orphanages, which I found out later in life, um, that um, transferred all of us to the mm-hmm. mines. And for about thirty years of my life, I was told that I survived a plane crash. There was one plane crash that happened, and that was uh, killed half the babies. You know, there were a lot of children on the bottom of the plane. It was a cargo plane. So for the longest time, I was told that I survived that plane crash. So when you're adopted and you have all these missing pieces and just little pieces, that was part of who I was. It was part of my foundation. It was part of where I came from. And then, you know, fast forward to Facebook, I found a nun who took care of me in Vietnam. And she let me know that you didn't survive that plane crash. You were in my care at X date and... She gave us some really hard evidence that let us know that she was the real deal. Mm-hmm. And um, I went to visit her with my mom to make sure she was, um, you know, which was not a crazy person, person yeah. you know, because I don't know how, you know, when you tell people you're adopted, you meet interesting characters. <laughs> you know, it brings out mm-hmm. some strange people sometimes. And so I've had that happen, you know, meeting with veterans and. Mm-hmm. People who apologize for the war, you know, and you know, I'm American now, you know, because there's lots of changes, babies. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, a lot of the babies left, they didn't have any records. They didn't have their birthdays, they didn't have who they came from. They had a fake mother's name, which some of those adoptees found out later that that name was fake, which is uh, mm-hmm. devastating because you're holding on to this one piece of information. Luckily, I was told, you know, these, this information is, we're not sure when you were born. So, you know, 
this is when we're going to celebrate your birthday. And so there's a lot of still missing pieces. Mm-hmm. Do you remember your time at the orphanage? No. And what was like? I was a baby. Okay. I was weeks. Wow. Yeah. I remember my... Yeah. I was there for three years. Wow. I was there for three years from nine to 12. So you have memories. Yeah. Uh, decision, actually, I made myself. So I was nine years old. And I remember I... Um, my sister came, had to come with me because she was my legal guardian at the mm-hmm. time. You know, my mom just, she couldn't take care of me. So I mm-hmm. um, went to city council and I said, hey, you know, I need a change in my life. And then mm-hmm. I remember the eyes on this woman's face. You know, she at first it looked at me, she was like, okay, who is this kid? A nine-year-old kid right. wants to go into an orphanage. Something's not it, you know. Wow. And, yeah, my sister was right behind me. Um, she was crying. She was saying, you know, don't, don't go. We don't have to do this. And um, it was a very interesting time. It was very mm-hmm. interesting. I remember from day one of going into it, there was um, so much pressure to perform. Um, you know, the way they taught you discipline was through physical abuse Ugh. and verbal abuse. Um, there was no, you know, hey, you need to change this. It was, okay, we're going to mm-hmm. make an example out of you so that other kids can see oh, how so to sorry. act. And But I luckily, I picked it up. Relatively fast, you know, from other like, children, probably. from other children, and myself, you know, two or three times it happened to me. I said, "This, I can't let this happen again." So, I had to figure out ways to go about it, and you know, I found my ways to go and sneak out of the orphanage and go see my my mom and my sister and uh, not get punished. Sure. <laughs> so figure all the loopholes, but it, it was a very interesting time. Survival tactics. Survival tactic. Yeah. Which brings me to a point, actually. So when I was in the orphanage, I was 10 years old. Uh-huh. I, um, all of the kids in the orphanage were required to take music lessons. Well, that's one positive thing. There you go. So what happens if you didn't play the music right, you didn't get beat, did you? Well, that part, I didn't get that far. Uh-huh. I kind of just forced myself to do it. So I started taking um, singing lessons and performing Amazing. folk songs. Oh. And, you know, it started off small, mm-hmm. and then the program expanded into, you know, 10, 14 kids, and then we started performing all over the country. And As it, soloists or a choir, or both? Actually, both. Oh, nice. Um, some songs we were able to perform on our own. Mm-hmm. I still have all the recordings, actually, today. Oh, I'd love yeah. to hear those. Um, so, and then some were as a group. Um, you know, I remember we would spend hours and hours stitching and making costumes and, you know, making... Um, and friends. Yeah, and making friends, yeah. yeah. So that's one thing yeah. you and I share is, you know, that, I guess, that passion for it. Mm-hmm. And I'm, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to reconnect with that. Yeah. Um, yet, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. A lot of adoptees are creative people. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you found that, but... And they have some outlet that they are creative. Yeah. I just think that's just in who we are. You know, it just, it's an outlet. Exactly. You know, you know. For me, I think it just takes time, and I'm sure, as you know, time to figure it out, you know, the things that you were naturally good at. Right. And kind of break away from what the society tells you and what, you know, people that your mentors and anyone mm-hmm. who's above you tells you and then say, hey, you know, instead of doing that, Kind of going the traditional route, yeah. And then they'll get a job and do this, and then, you know, go right. and pursue something mm-hmm. that I'm truly passionate at and can become better. And you can you can also take that exact statement that you just have and mm-hmm. put that into the music business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a struggle on all of them, really. How did you get into music? Um, music lessons. You know, my parents supported everything creative, and I think that it was just in my blood, you know, I wanted to be a singer and a dancer, and I was probably a, I was singing into flower buds when I was a little girl, you know, so the singing part, um, the, the music part came because of ballet, so at a five years old, you learn that music makes your bones, you know, you feel it in your bones, and you feel it on counts, and you feel... So actually, I feel like that is when I was introduced to music, is through dance. And so, you know, if I could have my total dream, I'd well, be a singer and a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> so there's still time. Um, but, um, 
that evolved into, you know, wanting to be in a band. You know, I just wanted to be in a band so bad. Was it your parents that initially pushed you towards that, or? No. Okay. They, didn't, they never pushed me. It was always like, you know, this is, she's got talent, so let's support that with, you know, operatic voice lessons. So I was trained operatically, you know, at a young age, and that gave me a foundation, just like ballet gives you a foundation for dance. Mm. And so she was, she was really good in supporting those, those talents. Like that's what she's interested in. Let's see where that goes. And so I never, and I never quit lessons. I was never that person. So it just evolved into, and I just love doing it so much. Like I feel like I will just die if I don't. I'll wake up and die. So it's one of those things that just drives me. I mean, it's 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 not even a choice. It's that's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of artists, you know, feel that way. That's just what they want to do. And you've obviously managed to do that throughout, you know, most of your life. Yeah, I have somehow. Because when you want, I believe that, you know, if you want to do something, you put your mind to it and you do it. Mm -hmm. And however, you, you don't take no for an answer. And I mean, being Vietnamese and singing in the blues world, imagine the, you know, amazing things people would say. Yeah. You know, on the negative side and the positive side. You know, that in itself was a challenge. And just the stereotype of Asians that sing karaoke. Oh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just, there's a lot of challenges. And you just you just go with what your heart wants to do and you just do it. And there's a lot of challenges right now. Currently, I feel challenges here in Austin because mm -hmm. I left a well-greased career behind. New um, city, new environment, yeah. new network to explore. New network. But at the same time, it's exciting because mm -hmm. it means new, new players, yeah. new players, new connections, new um, a new spin on what my music is going to. I know that the Austin scene is going to bring something to my music that's going to be really awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that looks like yet, but I know that. Like, I know that in my bones, that's when I'm not going to give up. So for the first time in life, I have a, a day job. You know, like as an adult, I, I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I've had various jobs to support music, but never like a Monday through Friday job. Mm -hmm. And so before my day job was cover bands mm. and singing at weddings and being that person. But I think in Austin, I'll keep the day job so that I don't have to do the wedding if mm -hmm. possible and get specific. You know, so that's kind of my plan here. So we'll see. It's evolving. I read... <laughs> So I read a lot of your story, and um, one of the things that was, I was fascinated by was your relationship with Howard Jones. Oh, did you know who he was? You might be too young. I, I was, so then I had to you know, <laughs> look it up and yeah. do my research. Um, did what, you recognize it? Any of you briefly, yeah. briefly. I'm sure my dad would be able to more so, probably, you know, because I'm sure he's listened to all, all of yeah, um, pop. Mm -hmm. So I was so I'm curious to know what kind of influence did he have on you, especially at such a young age? Because you said it was six, six, yeah. six years old. He was my first piano lesson, so he was just an artist trying to make it, teaching music, which a lot of artists do. And I thought mm -hmm. about that too. Um, I don't know if it's my wheelhouse, but anyway. So my mom once again, she's like, "Let's get the kids piano lessons." <laughs> so. So we go to the piano lessons, and we walk in, and he's got all these uh, synthesizers, you know, and they're massive, because I'm little, you know, he's got four, they're like, you know, four of them stacked up like this, and a piano. And so if you had a great lesson, you could go over and play wow. the keyboards. And so you think you're going to go over there and go crazy with them, and so he'd go over there like, mm. you know, like, <laughs> dude, okay, I'm done. <laughs> but um, he actually taught me tone. So he'd hit a note on the piano and say, can you sing this note to see if I was tone deaf? Because some people just are. And then later on, I saw him after his heyday was over. He was still playing. You know, instead of stadiums, I went to like 3,000 people, which is still a lot to me. I'm like, I would love to play in front of 3,000 people. But anyway, um, so I got to see him backstage. And he remembered us because my mother paid piano lesson money even when we didn't go. And so he was very grateful for that and remembered who we were. So I saw him backstage, and I was not doing anything with music. I was kind of floundering around trying to figure it out. And he says, so you want to be a musician, and you want to be in the music business, huh? I said, yeah. And he said, I just want you to know that it's not 
who you know, it's not luck, it's all hard work. And so I took that to heart. And I, I do believe that. You know, I mean, you can always, when people say, oh, we had this great opportunity, and that was lucky. It's like, well, because you were prepared, because you worked your you butt off for it. You were your own luck. Yeah, you were prepared, and that opportunity happened. Mm-hmm. What was he like as a, as a teacher and mentor? <coughs> um, I remember being very encouraging, but I was really young, you know, so... I think mostly the influence was watching 3,000 people sing to his music, knowing every word. I was floored, because I didn't know he was that guy. Like, I was in his music room as a student, and then we moved to the United States, and I saw him on MTV. I was like, what? <laughs> what happened? So, I, you know, that piece of advice, I've always thought about that. You know, when I'm struggling, it's like, okay, well... You need to start working harder, maybe, you know, or maybe you're not, maybe it's something you're not thinking of doing, you know, and so that's kind of what's driven me, it's, it's helped me. Interesting. So how do you come, how do you overcome that doubt? So you, you mentioned a lot, you know, how you have to work hard. Yeah. You. Anything, I, right? Exactly. And I'm sure you hit, you have hard days just as all of us do. So yes. whenever, whenever you have those, you know, how do you find that motivation to know that, okay, I just got to keep going, or this is just another struggle that mm-hmm. I have to push through, and how do you maintain that vision in front of you? You know, I think for me, it's, it's interesting that you're asking me these questions right now, because it has been a struggle to be here, because like watching people play when you're not playing as much as you're used to playing is like watching people eat when you're hungry, mm-hmm. and so I think it's about healthy choices. So you make those choices, you you do what makes you, whatever your meditation is. For me, it's it's working out, you know, get those endorphins going, you know, find find that happy, go out in nature and um, be, be with the trees and the birds and, you know, surround yourself with people who love you, who are good influences on you. But when you're, if you're solitary and you don't have a friend at that moment, it's about making a healthy choice. What's going to make me feel eating good food, you know? Mm-hmm. Or, um, but to me, like, find that meditation. What's what's going to find? What's going to help you find your center? Because I mean, all of us get thrown off at all times. Yeah. yeah. And so, what's gonna what's gonna bring you back? <laughs> even if it's thinking about the ocean, you know, even small things like that. I don't really, you know, my journey with God is still evolving. Like, I don't know that I believe in, you know, the surfer guy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) On the the wall, you know, I was raised Catholic. And I don't know that the church is what helps me. Like, some people have a lot of faith, and if if that helps me, great. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's, I am spiritual, and I believe in energies, and so get your energy right, and if you can get that right, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna flow. And I think people will pick up on that, and that's, you know, then you get law of attraction, and you know, I think that you and I have a law of attraction. You know, there's something. What brought you to me mm-hmm. at that club that that mm-hmm. night? You know, I knew that I'd walk out of there with. I knew I had to go. I didn't know why. Mm. And when I left. And I was having I a was the shitty same, day. I was the same exact way. Can you see that? I was having a terrible day. And I was like, you have to go to this. Like, just, you know, put on your big girl panties and go. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a point where I walked in and I'm like, what am I doing here? I don't know any of these people. Mm-hmm. And then I sat down to listen to the music because that's what brought me there. My friend was playing bass. Next thing I started talking to people. Next thing you know, you were in my face. And so, you know, it was just one thing led to another. So... You know, pick up those cues in life. If you feel like in your gut that you should do something, you're not sure why, you should probably do it. Just going to do it. Yeah, except if it's jump off a cliff. Don't do that. But, you know, I mean, like, pick up the cues. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, if you keep your mind open to stuff like that, then I think that it can take you to a good path. You know? So I've never, heard of, the, <laughs> so I've never heard of the concept before, actually, from anyone before you just mentioned it, of finding a friend... Or a comfort zone mm. when you don't have one. I think that's very. I mean, that's huge. And yes. We always do it, but we. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I do it all the time. But 
I can guarantee that there's some times I'm not aware of it. Mm. You know, when, of finding a friend. Well, or not, that you can do it on your own. You can do it on yeah. your own, yeah. and it could be as it literally is as simple as you know going for a walk or doing mm-hmm. something that's going to help you increase your energy level yeah. and clear refocus, your head. clear your head, recenter. I mean, that's what mm-hmm. it's all about because we're all our best selves when we're centered. When, and we've all seen our worst self too, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, how do you get back to your center? And sometimes it's hard to reach out too. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's hard to absolutely. ask for help or it's hard to be that person like, going, oh, my music career sucks. You know, like, they're tired. You don't, you don't want to be that person. Like, I don't, anyway. I'd rather be more positive, but sometimes, you know, shit, day. And so to get myself out of it, I always feel better when I can get myself out of it. Uh, you know, because yeah, yeah. you're like, oh, okay, look at it. It's not so bad. I can do this. You know, I can keep going. Were you always like this as far as having a positive mindset on life, or did you make I, a transition at some point? I've always been that way. I've been half, you know, glass is half full. I've always been that person. And do you, oh, right. is there a specific person that you picked it up from? Was it your parents? Uh, probably mom. Okay. Yeah. She's pretty influential. She works really hard. I mean, she, Raised three kids and got her, got her uh, college degree. Wow. You know, and you know, ended up now she's retired as a and has you know nice retirement as a teacher and you know she's done really good for herself and she's she did whatever job she could to make it work. Mm-hmm. And so I really respect her for that. And I watched her do it. That's the most important. Yeah. Because now I watched her work the off. in your in mm-hmm. your particular field. Yeah. So I can you know and she's. She's not, um, I don't know how she'd feel about me saying this, but she's not <laughs> fuzzy. It's like, she's kind of matter of fact, like, you know, you just need to do this, this, and this, you know, like, kind of, she's, she'll let me boohoo a little bit, but mm-hmm. <laughs> everybody wants to boohoo with their mom. But for the most part, you know, she's, she's pretty matter of fact, and she speaks the truth. I mean, mom's, yeah. you know, my mom knows me the best, so, and I'm lucky for that. Like, that doesn't always happen. What's your relationship like with your dad? Uh, it's really good also. I mean, it took a minute because they divorced mm. when I was 12. So there was a little bit of anxiety there that I wasn't aware of until they divorced. But now as adults, like, you know, we talk politics. We talk life. We talk religion. We talk very openly, you know. It's a little more guarded than my mom. Moms mm-hmm. are different, though, you know, mm-hmm. for me. I feel the same way, I think, for me. So I got here when I was 12. Mm-hmm. I didn't speak English. Or, you I know, know, that's amazing. You know, I didn't know anything about this part of the world. Yeah. Um, and I was actually just looking back at, at this when I saw my family just this past week, mm-hmm. how my relationship with them has completely transformed. Mm-hmm. You know, before college or before any, any of, you know, big steps in life, I guess you could say, right. um, it was more so, you know, here's a task. I would do it and move on to the next one. But mm-hmm. now, the conversations went from that to just like you said, just life. Mm-hmm. And I feel like there's always been a genuine interest uh, in each other's lives, but now sure. I think it's just increased to, to another a whole other level. Yeah, it's nice though, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, guess I can have a conversation like that for like an hour. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> you know? yeah, and it's something I definitely. Um, yeah, something I enjoy and I, you know, I, I cherish it because I haven't. Yeah. From my past, I haven't had a chance to do that, especially when I was living in Russia, um, because you know my mom, she was an alcoholic, so it was, yeah. it, was it was hard to do that on a daily basis. With her. Exactly. Because her her energy was all her, her energy, you know. And every single day, I still remember it to today. You know, the conversation would be me asking her when she would stop, mm. and she would say tomorrow. And the tomorrow would turn into, you know, weeks, months, mm. years. So that's that's why I was just curious to know yeah. how your relationship with your parents was. And Have you had a, had a chance to reconnect with your biological family? If no. they're alive or? I don't know. Okay. Is that I mean, something that you would want to do? Oh, of course, of course. Mm-hmm. And I've watched uh, one of my adoptee friends, she actually did connect through DNA testing. Mm. Like she's got an amazing story too. Like she actually took the DNA 
she took the, the test to Vietnam. There was this mission finding parents who were looking for their kids in America. And she, you know, took them back to the United States and not knowing that one of them was her dad. Wow. Yeah. The chances of what are the chances of that happening? Oh, it, it is. And so he knows who her mother is, and to this day she hasn't. She just wanted to do one parent at a time, which I get that. You know, it's like it's it's, it's a small Yeah. Uh huh. So they she found her parents, but because so I did the DNA test to see if I could find it just I just wanted to find out if I was half because any Vietnamese person that I've ran into for the most part doesn't think I'm Vietnamese, mm-hmm. and maybe because of the, I'm Americanized, but um, they're always asking me if I'm Filipino, so. I'm like, whoa, let's find out. <laughs> you know, it's like, and for the longest time, I was like, oh, well, you're half white. My parents were like, you're definitely half white. Okay, let's find out what it is. I found out that I'm not only not half white, but I'm 100% Southeast Asian with roots in Madagascar. Mm. I know, it's like, wow, I'm part Lemur now. <laughs> so it's, it, it's an interesting journey, like another piece of the puzzle. Like, okay, mm-hmm. now I can stop looking at you know, middle-aged white What's men next? that are veterans and be like, are you my dad? <laughs> you know, seriously. That's, what, I mean, I have this overwhelming, you know, uh, pull to them because I wanted to know if they, one of these guys was my dad. Every time I met a Vietnam vet, I would wonder that. And so now it's like, actually, my dad was probably a Vietnam vet, but for the Vietnamese, mm-hmm. you know, but no records. So there's no records. So they have to, they have to be in the same database that I'm doing my DNA test. So what's unfortunate is there's not a universal database. It's like, okay, they did it through Ancestry, then you might find a link. But if they do it through this over here, mm-hmm. we're not going to find each other. So I don't know why that is. Mm. I found a fourth person, yes, and that's it. Yeah, she's oh, also nice. an Opti. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. We haven't met yet. One day. Yeah. It's not high priority for some reason, because uh-huh. we share great, great, great grandparents. So it's like really far removed, and but she's an adoptee, and I, you know, analyzed her face. And Does she live here? No, she lives in Southern California. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't know much about her. We kind of talk loosely on Facebook, and I don't know. You you kind of find out stuff about your past, and then you go back to your life, because that you know that is part of your identity, but. Most of your life is what's made you you. Like you have these little pieces that keep changing. So I mean, I think it's, I think that's why I don't really dive into it. Some people have a real, they want to find their parents. Mm-hmm. But that's just not my mission, I guess. Yeah. How do you face a lot of the you know, stereotypes and whatever else, <laughs> like racism or whatever they may be thrown your way? I'm sure by now, or I don't know. By now, you probably have thought, figured out ways, but how did you do that at the beginning? So other people that, you know, may be facing it mm-hmm. can follow similar steps. Gosh, you know, that's a tough question because I think I'm still dealing with how to... I, I tend, it's in my personality to, to not want to make somebody feel bad or uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So at my own pain, I probably laugh stuff off and, you know, brush it off as, you know, there's times where I've, I've, you know, I've said, you know, don't say that. Mm-hmm. It's just wrong. And so I think that's where you need to stand, you know. If it makes you feel bad, then tell somebody. So really just be self-aware? Yeah. Self-awareness. But, you know, it depends, it depends on the situation, too. I mean, there's a lot of times where I blow it off because it's like I just don't want to go there. I mean, I've had that even against that kind of energy directed towards me from Vietnamese people. Like, you're not Vietnamese enough. Mm-hmm. How come you don't speak your own language? So there's times where I just really don't want to get into it. Well, I was adopted and this and that, you know, and that's, that's bringing up stuff that I really don't want to share. It's special to me, and I don't want to share it with a stranger. Mm-hmm. You know, who I probably won't ever have contact with again. But then there are times where I feel open to sharing. So it just depends. I mean, it really does. It depends on how I'm feeling that day. Do I want to get heavy with this person about my life? Or do I want to just say, oh, no, I'm Filipino. I mean, I've said that. Just so they don't ask me any more questions. Like, 
It's like, you know, people hear you're adopted and there's weird, as you know, there's weird um, reactions to it. Everything from I'm sorry to are you okay? Um, wow, that must have been really hard. Or in meanwhile, you feel like, I'm fine. You know, we weren't trying to go there with that. Just like any other person. I was just telling you that I was yeah. adopted. Yeah. You know, some guy, his reaction was, oh my gosh, we bombed your country. I'm so sorry. And I was like, oh. You know, <laughs> I didn't want it to go there. You know, I was just, he was just asking me, mm-hmm. how come you speak English really well? <laughs> so we went into it and then it went there. So. How does one become self aware? Mm, that's a good question. Therapy never hurts anybody talking to an outside source. I've had plenty of it. Um, I don't know. Ask ask the question to yourself, I guess. Uh huh. You know, be self. How do you how do you be self aware? Because I've been I've been wondering, you know, asking myself that question uh-huh. forever. But and there's no I don't think there should be either concrete answer no I think it's something that evolves over time sure because as you get older you will experiences exactly your experiences Mm -hmm. will change so you'll be forced Mm -hmm. to react in different ways learning lessons yeah I think learning lessons would be for me because you learn a lesson like okay well we're not going to do that (laughs) and then and when the situation happens again if you still (laughs) you know react the same way well obviously Mm -hmm. you know you're not being self aware of what happened to you, to, you know, and being good to yourself. Mm-hmm. So, I think it comes, yeah, it comes back to just being, what makes you happy? What makes you feel centered? And knowing what that is and finding out what that is. And what what is that for you besides music and friends and whatever else that you may have? What brings you the most joy in life? That's a big, loaded question. <laughs> We can break it down. <laughs> um, I think that I'm when I'm at my best self, that's when I'm happy. So whatever that is, whether it's as simple as looking at the ocean to cooking good food to obviously singing is huge because you have these connections. Mm-hmm. That's the ultimate, really. You know, I mean, just being good to yourself. Because we're not always choosing ourselves, you know. Mm. You put parents Different first. You put, on. you put friends first. You put so it's important to put yourself first. You know, that's okay to do that. I think as adoptees, we tend to, you know, we were we're supposed to be so grateful because, yeah. you know, but really, it's a miracle. yeah, you should be so grateful because. You were adopted, but then people forget why you were adopted. Because mm-hmm. you were abandoned. So actually you're a victim. And I think that people don't deal with that, even adoptees. They forget about that part. And they maybe later in life they they go back to that that hurt of being abandoned. Mm-hmm. I stopped saying abandoned like a couple of years ago because it wounded me every time I said it. But that is what happened. We were abandoned for whatever reason. And then when someone says, oh, well, your mother gave you up because she loved you. Well, so then, okay, so love equals abandonment then. Mm. And so I think that if adoptees deal with these deep, deep wounds that are in, you know, that start when you're in the womb, you have this bond with your mother. Mm -hmm. And then you're taken away in whatever age. That's traumatic. And I think that society forgets that. Mm-hmm. They think you're so lucky. You're adopted. You got this great life. You're lucky to be in America, and you have an opportunity where you wouldn't have it here, and all this stuff. But they don't realize that there's actually some really deep wounds that adoptees have to deal with. Absolutely, yes. I've I've noticed that within a lot of people, myself included, mm-hmm. that there were times when I almost had to wear different masks. Mm-hmm. You know, just based on how the society reacted to me. Yeah. You know, you come in here. It, I was relatively old was considered at that point right. so yeah. I had to act in a certain way you mm-hmm. know so I've experienced it all like just like you said people say oh you speak English so well and, yeah. and you know yeah. it just 
it's a practice. Yeah. It's like you did it. <laughs> Do you um, like your parents at all? I mean, or you know, when you're with them, at least on the outside, does it look question. like that's their son? You know. Yes, and maybe yes and no. Mm. I would say um, yes because I've acquired a lot of the ways that they act. Mannerisms, probably. Mannerisms, yeah. The way they speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you see it in action, then, you know, people, I think, would have a hard, harder time um, pinpointing and figuring out, okay, maybe this person is not part of the family, but um, maybe when I'm outside, maybe not. Mm -hmm. I've never, you know, I've never really focused on that question because, yeah. um, for me, one of the harder things has been to do is to um, not necessarily rebuild those 12 years, mm -hmm. but in a way to rebuild the 12 years. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's it's the first 12 years. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, it, it, those years are so important because that's when, you know, you really get to know your parents mm -hmm. and you're learning from them. Yeah. Versus when I came here, I was still, I'm still learning from them, but... Yeah. And you I also remember. remember. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Even in death. Yep. But I already knew so much from my other set where yeah. um, another interesting thing for me was at 12, I decided to, I think first week or first couple days, mm. I decided to call them mom and dad instead of using their first mm. names. And I noticed that that's a um, challenge. You know, it just felt normal. That's good. It felt as if they're your parents, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily. And you wanted that. Exactly, exactly. So. And it's not necessarily like it needs to happen. It just, it was one of yeah. those things where I said, it, you made it, that just is, it just is what it is. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's, that's nice. So I completely agree with you. I think um, getting away from the masks that the society wants you to wear. Mm -hmm. is huge in figuring out who you are and, and who you want yeah. to be. And they don't understand because you're in, in I think it takes a lot of a lot of self awareness to figure out how you feel about it mm -hmm. too. So that you can take a stand with it when people react a certain way. Yes. You can own it. I don't totally own it yet because I'm still evolving about I mean it was, it's still evolving how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll, it'll be a long, long life journey, I don't know. Yeah. It takes courage. Um you know, when, mirror, yeah. yeah, exactly. When I uh, when I first started dating doing this, mm -hmm. you know, it took a lot of courage on my end to not only publicly release my story and everything about it, but actually turn it <laughs> into something for other people to mm -hmm. use. Um, it's awesome to see them because adoptees yeah. need each other. Yeah, they really do. The yeah, no, I I completely yeah. agree with you. I think having that network is absolutely needed. Um, you know, it's something that's not there, or it is there in certain parts, but mm -hmm. I think it could definitely be better. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it just depends on your, like, I have some adoptee friends who had a network because they, there was a handful of adoptees in the same city, mm -hmm. and all the parents bonded, like, oh, we all got our children from Vietnam, and, you know, and so they have that, they, they were lucky to have that, I didn't have that because it was an Air Force brat, so mm -hmm. meaning we traveled every two years, and there wasn't a community. You know, it was just like, this was our normal, so. But it's nice, like, like I haven't, I didn't meet another adoptee until, like, maybe three, four years ago. Mm. You know, I didn't go to an adoptee uh, kind of a, an, an event where there was other adoptees around, and it was great. I mean, and why, why was, was that? So I don't, um, I think I was, one, we, there wasn't the resources where we were. My mom, it wasn't a priority. And there wasn't like the Vietnamese culture to try, you know, in Alaska. There wasn't it's stuff like in England. Like, there wasn't that. She's raising three kids. So I think that's why she didn't you do that. That was already her. enough of her. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. She was just raising her kids. And for me, I was just living my life. And there was a point where just, you know, the planets aligned. I'd start asking questions. Mm. You know, you start asking questions. You start wondering, how can I act this way? I wanted to dig deeper in why I was acting this way. Is it because I'm adopted? I wanted to fix some things. Why I thought I need to fix some things. And so I'm like, is this from being abandoned? Uh, you know. Did you always know that? Yeah. You know, when you were first brought in, yeah. 
or was there a time when they when they finally told you? Well, see, my parents are Caucasian, mm. so I mean that would have been a, <laughs> like I'm gonna stay this way. You, know? <laughs> you mean I'm not gonna have you know blonde hair, blue eyes? No, I I was a brown baby, you know, with two biological brothers who were you know white as can be. So I always knew. She she always told me. I'm always floored when people say. Oh, we're gonna tell him later. It's like what? That is gonna that's gonna just be not the right decision. Devastating. Yeah. Devastating. Mm-hmm. So yes, I've always known. She's always told me. Interesting. The story's just kind of changed. It keeps changing, but yeah, yes, I've always known. So my struggle as being the only brown person in the white family is being seen as part of the family. So it's always like, no, those are my brothers. They're not. That's not my brother. Mm-hmm. You know, or you know, that is my dad. I'm not his male or bride. You know, like I find myself when I have dinner with my dad saying, "Hey, dad!" Like I say it a lot. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't aware of that till you know one day. Like, oh, my girlfriend said she did the same thing. That's why I do it too. I was unaware. <laughs> I was unaware of why, but yeah, because I didn't want people to think I was his, his, you know, Vietnamese wife. You know. My dad. Mm. So that's ongoing to this day. I want to jump back to leadership. And sure. so clearly you're becoming a leader in what you're doing. Um, what do you find as a great leader? Uh, Self awareness. Mm-hmm. I think putting yourself in other people's shoes, um, knowing that you don't know everything. And surround yourself with people who know more than you, for sure. Because you'll just rise to the level. And just treating people how you want to be treated. There's a lot of answers. How are you able, so how are you able to... I messed up a lot to find these answers, by the way. Oh, absolutely. And that's what it is, a lot. just trial and error. <laughs> yeah, people tell me, you know what, you can't do that. Okay, you're right, I can't. You're, that's not a good way to be a leader. So... How are you able to maintain those mentors and those connections over time? So you just so you just moved into a new city. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming you still keep in touch with people from where you were from. Yeah. Well, I go back to California quite regularly and play music there. So I'm keeping my toes in the water, just because I have it's it's fun one, and they're paying me to do it, and I get to spend time with all my people, you know. Mm-hmm. So it. It's like any relationship, it takes some work. You know? And um, I think it's important for me to keep going back to California periodically to play. And now my stock has gone up now that I live in Austin. Because <laughs> they can't come and see me four nights a week like they used to. You know, Like when you're playing four nights a week, you're like, oh, I get see you time. Now, nope. Maybe every couple months, maybe. you know, Next year's going to be even less, probably. Because I think mm-hmm. I need to up, up the ante here and make them you know, want, say, yeah. make them want to see, you know, what I'm bringing to the table, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. Mm. So, you know, I think it's important to make new connections, though, too. And I think Austin has a lot of things that I could learn. A lot to offer. A lot to offer, a lot to learn. A lot, mm-hmm. There's a lot of really great players here. And there's, um, yeah, I mean, just knowing that there's a lot to learn here. That's what I want to do. And I think that's where I'm at right now. I'm just, I'm watching and I'm learning. Mm-hmm. It's humbling. And that's the way to always do it. It's humbling though. Yeah. Because I would really love to just get out there and you know tear it up, but that's that's not happening right this second. You have to wait your turn. <laughs> I know. You can't just come in and slay. Uh huh. But I'm trying. You know, I played you know a handful of gigs here, and I like it. I'm liking it. Are there any other skills that you've discovered over time that? You know, you they're just natural. So, for example, for myself, when I was younger, one of the things that I used to do was write poetry. Mm. I used to climb on a window sill in the orphanage, and you know, would be told to go to bed at nine or ten, mm-hmm. and whatever light was available, I just write poetry. Um, That's awesome. And I don't know how this happened. It's just one of those things which just happened. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. And in the morning, when I would wake up. You know, be like on perfect lines and everything. And wow, um, I, would, I, would just, I would just ask myself, okay, how did I do that with the lights? So, 
Anyway, so I was doing that, and then I stopped for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. And then I was having dinner with a friend of mine here, and he asked me a question. He said, what's something special about you that no one knows? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew that, okay, I used to sing, I used to do this, but Mm -hmm. then it kind of clicked, and I was like, okay, you also used to write poetry. So then I, I picked it back up again. It's good for you. Yeah, so that's been up. So I'm more curious to know if there's oh, anything that you've knowledge. discovered discovered over time. That I'm that, that. That's not musical. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that I'm a good people mover. What, is, what does that mean? That means that... I'm good at herding cats. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a skill, it really is. I mean, some people don't like to do it, but I think I'm good at getting people together. Would it be in a band? Would it be an event for a party? Would it be family members? Would it be and maybe that's a that could be, you know, women. We we are we, we network naturally. Mm-hmm. So it could be that. So connecting? Yeah. Or and managing. Connecting and managing people. Okay. That's something that, I mean, could go in our leadership skills, too, by the way. Mm. What's a typical routine that you go through to help you manage all of your activities? All the gig, you know, mm-hmm. gigs and everything that you have in life. Yeah. How, how do you become organized? Or at least to a point where you can do it at a... Well, for me, I just write, I just, yeah, write stuff down. You have to... Um, I know plenty of people that are not, not organized that are extremely talented, so I think it just, it, whatever is going to be good for you, like for your personality, like I think maybe there's a little type A going on there for me, uh-huh. you know, so it's control, you know, I can control these things. Um, how, 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 do you go, how do you go about the things that you can't control? Yeah, let it go. You gotta let it go. Yeah. Okay. I think, you know, as far as going back to your question, is like, how do you keep things organized? Well, you want to do something really bad, so you better do X, X, and X, you know? Mm-hmm. You, want to get the, you want to get to point B, from point A, you better do these things. And so it's, it's the drive that keeps mm-hmm. me on point, I think. Final thought. When odds are completely against you, what are some core fundamental principles? that you always refer to? Four principles. Um, I'd say, you know, just what I just did right now, you gotta exhale. And what was the question again? When everything is going wrong, <laughs> yeah. what are the core principles that you always refer to? I'm going to go back to the healthy, healthy choices. Mm-hmm. One choice at a time. One day at a time. One hour at a time. However that needs to be for you at that moment, when you're going nuts in your brain, make one healthy choice at a time. And then, you know, that, they'll all lead to better choices as you go. Like, but if you get up and you work out so that your day is going to go better. You need a healthy meal and you feel better, you know. Just one healthy choice at a time. Perfect. So how do people how do people find you? How do people keep up with your work? Um well for the best outlets. You know, fake look, face weird. <laughs> um my website is laraprice.com, L A R A Price Project. And you can follow me on Instagram, Twitter. You can be friends the old fashioned way. <laughs> I'm from the gig. Buy my music. Important um, to support. Yes, because the whole music ship is a, it's it's having some trouble right now in general. Why do you think that is? Because it's free. Oh, well, it's free. You can buy it, you can stream it for free. And when people stream my music, I get a check for like 0.01 cents per mm-hmm. song. That's devastating. I'm glad to get paid, but at the same time, it's like, wow, it's it's hard. What's it's typical difficult. production? What? How long does it take to produce, or how long CD? did it take to produce a CD? My last one took 
a month and about $25,000, which that could be seen as peanuts or a lot, depending on where you stand mm-hmm. on things. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks to crowdfunding, I got some people to pay half. Wow. Yeah, really was. You know, you don't know who your fans are until you reach out and ask for help, and mm-hmm. then, oh my gosh, here they come. Five dollars, thousand dollars, you know, twenty-five dollars. But that's hard work. Yeah, it just takes time. Just like anything else, it takes time to build it. Patience. Patience is, yeah. Yeah. Surround yourself with good people. So that when you are in the, in the dumps, you can... Rely on someone. Yeah, it's okay to talk to someone, reach out. You don't deal with it by yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. For being a part of this. My pleasure.